This is a mixed solo show, and by that I mean all the work is by one person, myself. It's made from 1976 to 2018, and it's called Stubbs Congaro, which I'll, I'll say I'll explain the reason and thinking behind that towards the end. The hang is meant to look like the work of four or maybe five different painters, and as I say, I am the kind of people I sort of, the few people I hang around with, uh, tend to refer to themselves as painters these days, not artists. And uh, anyway, so what I'm going to do now is talk about uh, about half of the work in the show and, t and talk about it in a broadly chronological fashion, starting with Head 2, which was painted in 1976. If there is one aesthetic to this, it's probably fairly punk, I suppose. I was trying to sort of um, play with the conventions and violate as many of them as probably possible in one painting. I mean, when I first showed this painting in 1976, it was referred to as a pastiche. I think basically I was responding to history, okay? The history of painting as it was, what should we say, as I, as I saw it, as it was received. You know, this is about a moment in history, it's not about a life. So the work had to move, it had to develop, it had to change. One of the most important changes was the way in which I painted. I decided to start using oil paint, which brings us to the next piece of work I want to speak about, which is No Such Thing. It's a kind of bare-faced stab at a history painting. The entire image is drawn and then painted using underpainting white, OK? So the whole painting is a white impasto. Everything here is painted in white. There is no colour, OK? It's, a, it's an all-white... It's, it's, in, it's in a sort of shallow relief, an impasto. Once that was, a, once that was accomplished, I, decide, I, well, I had to leave it to dry, and then I glazed it. And by glazing, I mean putting on the medium, a polymerised resin, actually, as it happens, and putting very, very tiny bits of pigment into that resin and drawing it across the surface, layer after layer, but actually spending most of my time with a piece of uh, cotton cloth in my hand wiping it off, rubbing it down and removing the paint, uh, which gives it this rather sort of luminous sort of look. The method carries on into the flower paintings. White impasto over the whole surface, including the actual so-called background, right? But what I was trying to do with this was look at um, genre, right? And the one that was the style council, as it were, had decided was the most... Um, least credible, shall we say, was flower painting. It was consigned to the kind of, you know, the, 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 the bin of history because it had become the kind of, uh, the, 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 um, the favoured genre of the amateur, okay? Right, so I thought, right, I'll, that's for me, that's brilliant. So I decided to paint flower paintings, or do a whole series of flower paintings, and I still do them intermittently, and they're all monochromatic, they are all painted with Payne's Grey and Charcoal Grey, which incidentally do not use black and white. They're not sort of, that's not an admix of black and white. That's made out of viridians, um, ochres, and et cetera, et cetera. By the way, the other thing about it is the paint is put on in that corner, you won't be surprised to hear, and dragged towards the light. So all of the time, the idea of the fall of light uh, is an important part of um, what I'm thinking about formally when I'm painting this painting. And I suddenly thought, what happens if you drop out the colour, right, from flower painting? Instead of doing something surreal or wacky or, or mannered, you just nudge something one degree. And in nudging things that one degree, that tiny, uh, a small decision with amazing ramifications, it, it's not meant to sit comfortably anywhere, whether that's in terms of its location or culturally. When you've spent the best part of 10 or 15 years standing in front of paintings, squeezing tiny bits out and pressing them down and squeezing them out and pressing them down six to eight hours a day, it's not a surprise that you develop RSI. And, and when that happened, I couldn't paint, basically. I, it was that bad. My whole shoulders and, and upper body had sort of seized up. And so I had to find a more immediate way of painting, okay, a different method, right? I wanted the colours to be as 
what should I say, visually uh, active as possible. I didn't want it to be the palette of the landscape painting. So basically, that's painted and dries, th and dries. then the local colour, such as it is, which is this, um, it's sap green with a lot of white, it is painted, and believe me, all of that is painted sap green, as are the chimneys, and then what I do, as I've done in the flower paintings, after the, the, the charcoal grey graphic is, is, is put in, is the whole of the painting is covered in Payne's grey, right? And then most, well, 90% of it, as you can see, is wiped off with a cloth. So it's painted by reduction. I paint, as, as I say, I spend more time on painting, on these paintings, as I did on those paintings, with a piece of cloth in my hand than a brush. Uh, it's something like sort of 100 to 1, the time ratio. This is a glaze. This is not mimetic painting. I'm not trying to paint that. It is paint. It's the, and this is, the, this is what's driving a lot of the new painting. I want to actually make the painting work more. I want to make things that can only be paintings. But I, I just want to show you the other painting made probably, it's made three or four years before that painting. And it's called Red Terrace. The local colour, which is all these pastels, and by pastels I mean uh, pigment where there is white in it so it becomes opaque, right? The glazes are not, obviously. So all of these, and the houses at this time are being painted in various different colours. It's, it was a, it characterised the new builds in, in the, particularly in the west of Ireland and some of them around the Midlands and, and uh, Dublin. And then these pastels are put on top and then over that is painted in, in a wet, and by the way, all of these black graphics, are, are, are this, ch this charcoal grey, are painted wet into wet. That's not the conventional sort of Manet-esque wet into wet where it's, there's a colour and it's a second colour. This is just a wet surface to give it this idea of slippage, yeah? Then, when that's dry, the, again, the whole thing's covered in Payne's grey and, or two coats of Payne's grey in the case of that wall. And then, if you look carefully, you can see the same here. The pitch change from there to there is the same as there to there, as it is there. And then, gradually, the glaze is softened so as these are closer toned, etc. Ah, yes. Now, but if you look quite closely, you'll see again this multiple glazing. A lot of people ask me uh, whether I paint upside down. I can't paint upside down. I can't even think upside down. So the landscape, such as it is here, these houses, which are ostensibly at the water's edge, they are painted the other way up, and then the painting is rotated, and then I mask up these ellipses. And trust me, drawing ellipses is uh, probably one of the most difficult things conceivable. So what I've done is I've had a set of stencils made that, and using a five inch brush whilst the rest is masked, painting the whole of... So at this point there are no boats. Then when that is dry I paint these white just basic silhouettes and over that I then paint that's cadmium orange, that's cadmium yellow obviously and then I will glaze the interior of the boat. So what I'm painting here is shadows the subject matter is the landscape, but the content is light, all right? So that's why these undeniably synthetic looking paintings, and that's what they are, they're no attempt at naturalism or realism, whatever you want to call it. This is a painting of, ostensibly, of the South Gare on the River Tees. And here, this is a more conventionally wet surface where the pastel, this cerulean blue and white, which is very thickly painted over the whole thing, is painted into very quickly with Payne's grey and then tiny little highlights of white in a more conventionally wet into wet way. Here the pigment is wet whereas here the surface is wet, okay? There's medium but there's no wet into wet, i.e. colour one, colour A into colour B. The, but this is more conventional uh, and that's a mixture of the two little painting that I've been working on and off for about ten years. I keep re referring to things being graphic. I'm a firm believer in working to your strengths or maybe your obsessions. Uh, and I'm an avid reader and collector of graphic novels. And all the way through, all the, all the way through my time at art school, in fact, at, you know, adolescence and adult life, I've um, 
been fascinated by various ways of representing things uh, and, and, and acknowledged the place of, of the graphic in, in contemporary life. And here, of course, the whole painting, with, ex with clear exceptions of the, uh, the, the buildings and the sheds, is glazed in this... Um, it's actually Indian yellow, a lot of it, because it is a wonderfully luminous and transparent colour. And then these are... Oh, it's very, very fine cobalt violet is glazed over it. And anybody who knows anything about complementary colours will know that it can also produce the most extraordinary greys, OK? And that's something that I've exploited in this painting. Well, I suppose it's, not, it's, it's a colour theory legacy from Impressionism, you know, the purple shadows in the in yellow light, etc. These are ways of thinking things through, working stuff out. Th th this, this is actually started out in, in, the, in, in, in the landscape. So intermittently I'm sort of, you know, I'm, I'm predominantly a studio-based painter, don't get me wrong, but occasionally there are small paintings like this that are painted uh, plein air, as they say. It's, I suddenly realised that the, um, the, the, the economy, it, that's what I really wanted, I wanted economy of means. I wanted the painting, I wanted to collaborate with the paint, the material, in creating a painting, because a lot of my paintings are particularly quite consciously over the years since the sort of appropriationist uh, paintings have become sort of second order paintings. They're paintings either about painting or they're paintings where the process is itself a, um, a, a factor in their making. This is about history, not about my sort of taste or sensibility or my feelings or anything as kind of um, transitory as that. I'm absolutely adamant that there is a, a, a contemporary school of painting that is post-conceptual. And by that I mean it's not painting made after, you know, conceptualism's heyday in the 70s, but made uh, with the full knowledge of and embracing the legacy of conceptualism and conceptual art, but nonetheless being painting. There are other people, or there are other paintings and painters who believe otherwise, and you know, good luck to them. But I'm pretty sure that this is, you know, I, I, I think about painting, and I can see there's a lot of painting going on that is post-conceptual, right? That has embraced the legacy, and then works using that knowledge, not fighting it or trying to deny it. Which brings us finally to um, this <laughs> this little painting. It's got a lot to do with why the show is fashioned in the, the way it is, the way it's constructed the way it is. It was um, a quick sort of rip on um, a painting by George Stubbs of um, what he called a congaro. I'm a great fan and admirer of George Stubbs. Just want to put my cards on the table. Um, and his equestrian uh, studies uh, of the anatomy of the horse are without peer. They, they, you know, they are benchmark. Great technique, great craftsmanship, and, and a knowledge and love of his subject matter. But he would also be asked to do commissions intermittently. And uh, one of them was based on six small drawings, pencil drawings, sent back, I think, well, obviously sent back from Australia, uh, and along with a skin of a dead kangaroo, pelt, and um, Stubbs set about making a painting of the kangaroo, or congaro, rather, as it was called then. And uh, so he made an armature and uh, decided to fit the skin over the armature. So far, so good. But then he decides to inflate the skin using, you know, what the, in its day was this newfangled air pump. And, uh, of course, uh, it lost all <laughs> anatomical um, nuance, should I say. David Attenborough, I think, admires the painting immensely, uh, but thinks it's probably one of the funniest paintings he's ever seen. And it is, if you suddenly realise that what is ostensibly the first European um, study or portrait, for want of a better word, of a kangaroo, is in fact 
a painting of a seven foot rat. And it's, oh, it's all about the idea of fallibility, inconsistency, um, cock ups, uh, trying to sort of think it through and not always getting it right. And uh, I'd be the first to put my hand up to that. Thanks. Okay. <laughs>